right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Madison, Wisconsin by Lisa J. Smith. How are you doing, Lisa? I am fantastic. How are you today, John? Yeah, fantastic as well. And Lisa is the CEO and founder of Smithco, as you can see on the wall behind, a sales consulting firm focused on modern mid-sized B2B businesses, as well as being a dynamic public speaker and trainer and 30 years of B2B selling experience services in every economic environment imaginable. Yeah, over 30 years, there have been a lot, <laughs> a lot of different ones. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Um, and Lisa's design uh, is trained in design thinking, finance, business, strategy, sales, advertising, marketing. And these skills allow her to spot and reveal the blind spots most B2B companies encounter in their sales funnel. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And the great thing is uh, Lisa calls herself the, uh, what's it, the covid preneur. Yeah, you launched Smith, uh, Smith Co. in June of 2020. And despite right. everything, reached reached six figures in the first year and has maintained that. Uh, and that's amazing because let's face it, launching a business during COVID, unless you were selling, you know, masks, <laughs> probably not the greatest time. <laughs> oh, but I think it's the perfect time when we can talk about that in, yeah. in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, well, let's talk about uh, the blind spots and, you know, when it comes to b b sales strategy and, sure. and some of the actions that people can take. So, um, First of all, first of all, Lisa, actually come back to that point. Most people would say, oh, my goodness, launching a business during COVID. That's crazy. That was like the worst time to do something like that. But you give your opinion. Well, uh, I did it. So I guess my opinion is yeah. biased, right? <laughs> um, let me say that mid-career, I got an MBA. And the purpose of the MBA was two things. To better understand and translate the language of business, which initially mm -hmm. I wasn't trained in as a designer. And then secondly, to eventually own, start and own my own business. I'm naturally entrepreneurial. And so when COVID came around, two things happened. I immediately saw from a B2B perspective that the way traditional B2B organizations were going to sell evaporated overnight. Their mm -hmm. techniques were going to be gone overnight. Someone had to provide a different solution, a different path. And I was finally able to leverage a network that I had built up over 30 years, as you mentioned uh, in my intro, um, because I no longer had to be physically present uh, because we are now virtual. Mm -hmm. Yep. In, uh, to where the work was. And that provided an incredible opportunity for me to be able to hang my shingle and launch and reach those six figures in my first year. So I really saw it as an opportunity. And there is data that says in every recession that, you know, that's when businesses uh, start to flourish, they found and flourish. So I saw COVID as an absolute opportunity. Yeah. And, and I think, no, it's a great, great story. And, and, and what I think about that is the adaptability. And I think that is, if there's anything, I mean, business is moving at light speed today, as we know, and things are constantly changing. Yeah. So having that adaptability and the ability to be nimble without chasing every shiny object that's right. out there, I think that's the balancing act that you need, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we can kind of pivot into where I think people yep. then get stuck, right? Yep. So as I work with these modern, modern professional service consultants, typically, and, um, you know, they're, they're more of a medium scale, I would say. Uh, they have been potentially in business for a long time. For example, one of my clients was an engineering company in business for 15 years. So they weren't just opening their doors. Yep. This wasn't a, a, an entrepreneur. And they, they got stuck because as you grow, you, you can't keep doing that Einstein quote, right? Don't keep, uh, don't expect different results from trying to do the same old thing. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen. So they get stuck because they don't take the time, first of all, to document a process. Mm -hmm. They're selling. Of course they're selling. They have clients, they have business, they're doing things, but they don't document a process. And you know, as well as I do, processing tools are key. So you need to understand how to do something effectively and repeatable in order to scale and include other team members. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that across that B2B sales funnel, 
which is kind of a bow tie yeah. in, in my analogy, you know, the, the, everyone thinks that sales is just the, the, the front part acquisition. No, it's the, it's also retention and growth and yeah. the whole team is selling the entire time. So, you know, your project managers, your client service, your strategy, they're all selling. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a process to help engage them across that relationship, then you're, you're not, you are going to get stuck. You are going to uh, be, um, hampered in sales. So that's the first one is like, have you documented your process? Write it down yeah. on a napkin, right? It doesn't need to be sophisticated. We can get there together. So yeah. I yeah. think that's so a just just on that one, um, Lisa, just piggyback off of that is it is amazing how many companies uh, still don't have defined sales processes or and I think this is as bad, if not worse have a sales process that hasn't been revisited in years. Right? Yeah. They did it some years ago and they just go, well, we have one. So uh, people have this idea of, a, okay, even if you can get them to put a sales process in place, it's a one and done, right? We've got our process instead of the fact that it should be dynamic because you should be reviewing how it's working all the time. A hundred percent. It's, I mean, we just said it, we have to be agile. It's constantly yep. evolving the mark. We have to reflect what the market is doing. Absolutely. And I think on that point, that's kind of the second blind spot. I think people start by targeting, uh, or they start by saying, I'm going to say yes to everybody. Mm. Right. And then they niche down and, and sometimes they're targeting the wrong prospect. They're not targeting the right, um, the, the ideal client for them. Maybe that's the ideal client that's making them the best money or giving them the best talent. Um, and so I talk a lot about who are you targeting? Because yeah. if you do not really get into the minutia of defining who that target is, you can't find them. So that means all your marketing messaging and all your tactics that you're using are in the, in the wrong spots because mm -hmm. you can't locate them out in the marketplace. Yeah. And the other part that uh, of this obviously is, uh, yeah, often people default to having going too broad uh, because, you know, they're so desperate at the beginning just to get anything. But right. then you're right. It, it's uh, it, even for even more mature companies, sometimes when you ask them to define their ideal target customer, they'll give it to you at a very high level. But if you ask them to dig down into mm. it, you realize there's not always that much detail below it. So again, you're kind of superficially doing it, but then you're still spreading yourself too thin. Absolutely. And you know, the strategy, I read an incredible quote from Harvard Business Review. It's, it's really about saying no. It's about mm. understanding what you won't do, right? In order to laser focus on what you will do and what's going to be most profitable. And I think that's scary. No mm. one wants to say, I'm only going to focus on these niche or this segment. And I'm, but what happens is, of course, you're not going to say no. Other people are going to come to you and you're going to say, yes, I want to work with you. But yeah. it helps you be more effective when you, when you do that. Yeah, because I, I used to refer to it way back as the feel-good funnel, um, mm -hmm. uh, where we pack loads of opportunities into the early stages, and we don't qualify them properly because we kind of feel good having them there. And you know, we tell our we tell our sales manager, "Oh yeah, no, this month isn't good, but six months time, I've got so much stuff in the pipeline; it's going to be fantastic." And of course, six months time, I'm going, "Well, I need another few months." <laughs> so, to your to your point is cleaning out and being very rigorous on your pipeline and find the process is something that's actually quite scary to people yeah. and not just to the sales but to management we did it years ago with one company i was with and we cut down we traditionally had five or six times stuff in the pipeline and we cut it down to three because we were rigorous mm. our results were better but initially it scared the parent company yeah, it, there is a fear factor. There is risk. Anytime you say no, there's risk. Mm -hmm. So um, absolutely, I agree with that. And it, sometimes it takes a ramp up period. So you really have to have faith that mm -hmm. it's going to work. But, you know, if you either if you're starting out, you have to have faith anyway, right? If you're yeah. young, a startup, you, you're running on faith and a gut and a vision. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, to be relevant today, you have to have faith mm -hmm. and be willing to risk. Absolutely. Yeah. So what are some what are what are some other blind spots that people are are missing out on that are that are I wouldn't say I'd say simple and I don't equate simple with easy by the way and I think that's a mistake that people often make. Sometimes there are simple f fixes but they're not that easy. I mean you have to commit to them. 
It's so true. So you talked about filling the pipeline. I think the hardest thing to do, everyone hates the the initial sale, the networking. It's the follow up. Yeah. It's the follow through, which is part of that pop pipeline, part of that process. It's it's making sure that it, within that you're having many layers of sales conversations. To your point earlier, you know, you're qualifying those clients so you're not wasting time on people who are just maybe not ready to buy yet. And, um, you know, understanding the ebb and flow. Some people are ready right away. Some people need more time, you know, all of those things within the follow up without being everyone always says, I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to follow up because I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be schmarmy. I don't want to be in someone's mm -hmm. face. Yes, but you have to stay top of mind. You have to stay because everyone is is, is not thinking about you. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so that that's key. Follow up is key. These are it, it sounds so basic. Your point about being simple. It sounds basic, but it's it's really hard to do correctly. Yeah. No, and and your point is a your point is a really good one because yeah, we often do think are we are we spamming these people? Are we doing too much? Are we annoying them or whatever? But the reality is, I mean, if we take a step back and look at our own purchasing habits, I I mean, for instance, there's something I'm going through right now where I'm I'm getting people to to send in information and bids and stuff. And if some of them weren't prompting me, I'd probably forget about them because I have so much else going on. So yeah. rather than being annoying, it's actually making me go, oh, I really need to deal with this, you know, because it is it is something that is important that I need to take action on. Um, and actually, by by some of these people reaching out to me, they're helping me to keep it top of mind. Yeah. And that, and that's the whole point of follow-up is it's solution-based. So if yeah. you feel like it's going to be aggressive or in their face, just say, sure. Hey, you know, it's that, it's that, it's that nudge. Exactly. The whole point for B2B is, is solutions, right? Mm. We're trying to, we're trying to solve uh, a problem, um, which leads sort of to the, the fourth, if you will, because I have five, yes. <laughs> Top sales five, the fourth, which is um, sometimes people turn automation um, into, um, or excuse me, follow up into automation. Mm -hmm. And they're not really paying attention to the nuances of that, of timing, of messaging, uh, you know, because they're running fast, they're trying to be efficient. And I think it's a balance, right? I yes. mean, using technology is a balance. It's a tool. Everyone now is talking about AI. I'm starting to use AI and, and understand, you know, what it's going to do. And we're not going to talk about the political and the socioeconomic <laughs> <laughs> implications of that. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's a tool like any other. You still need you know, um, you know, this as well as I do sales is psychology and emotion. So if a human isn't behind those mm -hmm. actions, you're going to miss, you're going to miss yeah. a lot of those nuances. So you can't, it's great. Technology and automation is great, but you cannot rely on that for follow-up because then you're going to miss opportunities. Yeah. I'm, I'm well, and, and our position on this is, is, uh, is a pretty straightforward one. I mean, we think automation is fantastic. We've got an automation, automate, automatizer in our CRM. We love it. We love automation. Uh, but it should be taking routine road tasks away, you know, mean, somewhat menial tasks and that. But your automation should be making things smoother and faster and better so that you can engage yes. on, a, on a higher level so that you can expand the relationship and you can focus where, where salespeople really want to focus is building the relationship rather than doing road tasks. Exactly, exactly. But I think sometimes, especially younger mm -hmm. businesses, they get caught up and they're, they're not thinking about it in that framework so you're absolutely right um and then when and you're building way, just, oh, sorry just just add one other thing because i mean you can speak to this as well but you know especially because your success during covid is that the other part that they're missing out on is people are craving human contact they want to know humans are behind it they want to trust you they want, uh, this is the thing that keeps coming up in surveys it's really simple now people want to be seen heard and understood yes Yes. And I think we always wanted that. Yeah. I think that COVID just brought that to the forefront. I totally agree with you. Um, and the more now that we can do back in person, I, mm -hmm. I know, you know, the WHO called it off and we're good, but you know, it, we, ha we are changed and I think we do yeah. crave being with each other. So you're absolutely right. That human touch and, and it's the small little things, you know, how's your day going? How is your, how are mm -hmm. your kids? Those are the things that really matter because they do want to be seen and heard. I totally mm -hmm. agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So that was what, three or four? That's four. The four. final, the fifth right, and final, good. yeah, <laughs> is it's absolutely about data, right? I, you're in the data business, right? CRM, part, part of yep. what you do is a data business. But quite often, 
we're not tracking the right things. Mm -hmm. Many organizations are not tracking the right things as it relates to sales. So they might be leading and lagging, right? You're looking at your figures, but there's so many other things that you need to track related to satisfaction. Some of those qualitative things yeah. that I think that you need to track that harken back to this idea of having a human relationship with humans, right? Yeah. And um, people are just not taking the time to do it or they're, they're collecting a lot of data and then they're not sifting for the insights. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, you cannot be you can't know something is working unless you're measuring it. And then you can't know how to change it unless you have some relative point in the sand of what, you know, where to go from there. And, and so data, I became a data geek when I got my MBA data is King. Hmm. You can, it's, you know, but you can't, collect it for data sake, you have to kind of know what you want to do, those key KPIs. So I would say that that's the last kind of like blind spot. And again, sometimes it's like, well, I'm not a data person. I don't understand data. I don't want to read data. I'm in a professional service business. I'm a lawyer. I'm a CPA. I'm an mm -hmm. engineer. I'm a designer. It's like, yeah, but you're, you're, you need it. We're, we, we're in a data rich environment. So use mm -hmm. it to your advantage. Yeah. Go hire somebody on Upwork uh, for, you know, exactly. inexpensively to do the data analysis for you. I mean, there's lots of solutions, but I, I your point is a really good one. And I think what happened when the era of big data is people suddenly, you know, people got, wow, more is more. Let's get more, 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 more data instead of, instead of at the end of the day, it's not really big data, it's small data, it's relevant data. Absolutely. It's the data that we're, that's relevant to your business. And I think that you're a hundred percent correct is sometimes people gather too much data and yeah, it's fascinating and it's interesting, but it doesn't actually help you in any way. Right. Uh, and I also think, and you've probably seen this a lot is, we're very good at lagging indicators when it comes to sales. We're oh. very, we're very bad often at tracking leading indicators where we can actually make an impact. Absolutely, and, and in order, uh, yes, I just say yes, yes, yes to all of that. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm constantly talking about, and I always say, I sometimes I say like, do you want to play office or defense, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's I sometimes I have to put it in different uh, analogy because lagging and leading and eyes start rolling, gla glazing yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. But you're right, you're right. You can't make, you know, don't wait till the sales are not won or over. You do something <laughs> proactively so you can win more sales. Yeah. And I think that's and I think that's part of the issue is that people don't really understand what to look for in a leading indicator. You mentioned process earlier. There's a leading indicator. If people are following the process, if you've laid out a good process and you yep. validate it, if people are following the process, that's a leading indicator that you'll probably be successful. It's it's not that hard to find them. Exactly. I think it's mindset. You have a lot mm -hmm. of experts on the podcast talk about mindset. I think it's mindset. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, you know, pick one. I always say start with one or two. Don't start yeah. with 50. Start with one or two, measure those. You'll see what those the impact has on that, then expand from there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think that's the thing is is key. You pick pick a few and stick with them and then and then make sure that you're actually actioning them too. Uh, yes. Not just yeah. we're not just gathering, we're saying, oh, that's an interesting insight. That's an interesting insight. What are you going to do about it? Exactly. Uh, accountability and actionability are huge because the, the you know, sales is all about action, yeah. <laughs> right? It's about action. So um, I couldn't agree with you more there. Mm -hmm. And then just tell me, so I think this is such a wonderful opportunity now. You mentioned the, you know, you mentioned the customer experience earlier and that, you know, that your 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 revenues i mean a lot of revenues obviously come from um, retention and you know upsells and referrals and stuff like that right but you're right we tend to sort of stop at the acquisition point and think oh good good but the the customer experience starts when they interact with the brand for the first time all through everything that happens and thereafter uh and if there's any if there's any gap in that or if there's any if it's not a consistently good experience Everybody defaults to the worst experience out of all the good ones. That's human nature. Exactly. It, it, it is. And you also remember the the very latest experience. Yes. So it could be the it could be fantastic for four years and then something <laughs> happens and blips happen, let's be yeah, honest. Yeah. Sure. Right. And then and that's what they remember. It's like you mm -hmm. you forgot the four years when things were fantastic, right? <laughs> so it is, it's again, I, I train on this all the time. It's mm -hmm. mindset because people are like, I'm not, I'm not sales, I'm doing project delivery. 
salary. I don't have anything to do with that. You have everything to do yeah, yeah. with with sales because you're holding the client relationship in your hands, right? And so I, I and I do training on this. I talk about this all the time. We get so focused, and I think the world itself is so focused on acquisition that we sometimes forget that like sometimes it's just good listening skills. It's good people skills. Yeah. It's reminding yeah. people that you know those relationships that you're building. They're they're gonna if you listen for the right things, you can cross sell, upsell, right? And then those individuals, if you're taking really great care of them, they, they, um, they're going to refer you. This is really interesting. I had one last thing. I had a creative director once tell me that he felt like his job was to have our client get promoted, that we, mm. our work was so good that that individual will be recognized or that team will be recognized in the organization and they would get promoted for the, for the smart decisions. It's a totally different way of thinking yeah. about client service, right? Like we, we, you can have a much greater impact than you think of just solving the problem or maybe it's just ROI or bottom line. Yeah, but I, I love that one there. That's a, such a great one that your job is to get your whoever you're working with promoted because yeah, it should be it's your job should be to make them successful because here here's the other thing about B2B selling that sometimes people overlook and I would say this ad nauseum. It's like you know, B2C sale, like I can I can run over the road to Best Buy now and buy the latest, flashiest TV, right? repercussions for me is going to be my wife's going to come home and say, what'd you waste money on that for? We could have bought something else, right? You know, so worst case, I have to take it back maybe. But um, but in B2B, when I make a, when you, when you make a purchase, it can be mm. career enhancing or it can be career limiting if it doesn't work. Mm. And you can feel very isolated if you're the one who chose that thing that didn't yeah. work. So our job is, is, is absolutely to make people successful, but also to acknowledge the fact that there is emotion not just and and it's and the outcome isn't just for the company it's this personal outcome there too yeah absolutely and and you know gartner's done some amazing research around this about how and you talk about this too how complex and long tail sales you know mm. they these are and that you know they'll wait even though the pain is excruciating they'll wait because yeah. they don't have the confidence to make the right decision so yeah. we if that's our job our job is to give them confidence not because we're the best or the smartest but because they have all this we've answered all their questions and that they then they know that they're making the right decision for themselves in their company. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a per and a great way to end because I agree with you totally right now is that in especially in, in recessionary times or when markets contract or whatever, your biggest competitor today is no decision. Your biggest competitor yes. is just going, people go, I'm nervous about spending this yeah. money and you, uh, I'll just stick with it. And it doesn't matter yeah. how much the pain is, you'll, you'll put up with the pain if yeah. you're, as you, as you eloquently pointed out, if you're not confident and you haven't been made feel confident by whoever you're talking to that you can make this decision. It'll be a good one and it'll work. Otherwise it's very easy just to go, ah, well, I've, I've taken the pain long enough. You know, I've limped this far. I'll limp a little more. <laughs> Status quo <laughs> is the enemy. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, listen, Lisa, this has been great. All of Lisa's information will be below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and Smithco. Absolutely. So we are here to help your problems. And I would love to offer anyone a free 30 minute call with me. You can go to smithcous.com and sign up for that call. Or you can find me on LinkedIn at Smithco Sales or Insta or YouTube. There's all kinds of fun things. I'm constantly giving away uh, free tips and tricks because my goal is to help you succeed in sales. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, as I said, all of Lisa's information will be below this video. So I encourage you to go check it out and take advantage of that's a great offer. Take advantage of 30 minutes. As you can see, Lisa brings a lot of great insights and energy. So it'll be a fun 30 minutes. All right. <laughs> thank you so much. It was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.